back to another episode of the School of Why podcast. Today, I'm joined with one of my good friends, Eric. How are you, Eric? Hey, Frankie. Very excited for our conversation today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's Eric Rodriguez, right? Yes, sir. Okay, Eric good. Rodriguez. I always like want to make sure I get the names <laughs> right. Yeah, and uh, I forget sometimes people are just listening, so they might not they may not know that. It's like, oh, Eric, cool. Yeah, I know Eric. He's uh, from next door. <laughs> so, uh, Eric, you know, I appreciate you giving the time today. You and I connected recently um, in a community of other thought leaders. Um, a lot of the thought leaders that are out there, I love to have them on the show to really just go back and forth as a gift to the audience as, of different unlocks, right? So each one of us has our own uh, version or our own key, if you will, to unlock a door that is unique to us. And so um, having different types of guests helps for certain people in the audience that might resonate more with one story than another. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting, if you want to drop into this, uh, kind of how you got from being 11 in America, and then you talked about something called re-immigration yeah. with Ecuador, right? So you went to Ecuador uh, with your family, uh, which is your where your family is originally from. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah. so t drop into that for a second, and then how you got to where you're at now, which is a passionate person that has dedicated his career to helping people embrace disruption. Yeah. So thank how you. did you go from 11 years old to that? <laughs> yeah. So I, I was born and raised in Houston. Uh, I'm, I'm a Texas boy uh, from Sweet. parents that immigrated here uh, from Ecuador. And what's your favorite the, Texas college? Uh, I'm sorry. What's your favorite Texas college? Oh, University of Houston. That's OK. My, um, OK, that's fine. <laughs> if you weren't going to say now. UT, I just wanted to make sure you didn't say an A&M or anything. OK, cool. Keep going. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I had opportunity to, to, to grow up in Houston and at the age of 11, we made this very, you know, dramatic decision as a family to, to, to leave the United States and move to, to Ecuador. Um, at that time, Ecuador for me was a space that I would go and visit, you know, maybe a couple of years, you know, a couple of times, uh, I would go and spend some time with my cousins, you know, do the touristy things, but this was a very different, uh, experience. Right? I had an opportunity to go there. I had to learn Spanish for the very first time, even though I understood it, I had, wow. to, had to really understand it and, and, and learn it. And isn't Span the Spanish, the version of Spanish speaking there a little bit different than it would be in Houston? It's very different. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I always share that. I knew a little bit of the Spanish because, you know, when my parents would get upset. Spanglish? Spanish. You were like that kind of Spanglish? <laughs> Spanglish too. Yeah. Spanglish was, was very common uh, also at that time. Um, but yeah. So when I had an opportunity to move to Ecuador, that was really an eye-opening experience for me. I bet. Because it was bet. the first time. I had a chance to even experience poverty, right? My parents yeah. grew, up, grew up very poor. And, and even though they told me this, it you never just connect the dots, right? Absolutely. Like, okay, Absolutely. You have to go to TV. the other countries. Yeah. yeah. Like you would see it on TV, you would see it in a book, but you never see your father as a, as a young person experiencing that until I yeah. saw other kids living like that in, in, in Ecuador. And so that kind of started reshaping my, my perspective on, on, on things. And, and, and it wasn't until we started doing some volunteering, some community service that I started realizing, I was like, wow, like, like the world is very different here in Ecuador, just, you know, a few hundred miles away from it. It's a world away from how other, other families grow up. And, and so that started re reshaping my perspective. And then the final thing that really shaped my perspective was that was also the era that the Internet became relevant. And so when I was in seventh grade, my school just so happens that I'd opened up this computer lab for the very first time. And I was the first class that had a chance to go in that classroom, Frankie. And this class had, I mean, it, we had to share the computers, but still it was a, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it had the internet. And I was like, wow, like this is so cool. But not only that, but I had an opportunity to reconnect with the world that I had left behind, right? And so yeah. I got to see now how technology was now opening up doors of connectivity to the rest of the world. And I remember at that age just saying like, wow, one day I want to help, you know, in this, like I had no idea what an engineer was, a computer scientist was, I had nothing of that exposure, but I was like, wow, one day I eventually want to be in a space that brings connectivity to other people's lives because that completely started reshaping my life and what was possible. And, uh, and, and then eventually at the age of 16, the entire, fortunately the entire economy collapsed in Ecuador. My parents, lost m multiple of their jobs that they had at that time. And we had to leave the country. And again, we were very fortunate and blessed enough to have US, US citizenship that we were able to just pick up our luggage, the, the little bit that we had left and leave. 
Yeah. And, and we and we returned to Houston and kind of like a re-immigration to a certain extent, coming right. back to the United States with a completely new perspective on on the world and a completely new perspective on what I want to do, but also a completely new perspective of the privilege that I had to not only learn what I learned in Ecuador, but also be mindful of the individuals that probably didn't have a chance to leave the country when the economy collapsed. Right. I did. And so what I'm going to do about it is, is really what's going to make uh, make a difference in people's lives. That's awesome. Yeah. And that same that same type of purpose that was instilled in you at a young age, I, ha I had a similar experience. So by the time I was 20 years old, I'd been to 40 countries and not because my parents were diplomats or wealthy. Um, it was all mostly mission work. And so I've been to a lot of those spaces. The longest I've lived out of the country was seven months. And just that was very difficult to come back to America. I mean, I I was kind of never the same. But it, it, that is very difficult. I can't believe you did it in high school. I was at least out of high school. Um, I did it in between high school and college. But wow, that it is such a thing. But but it's such what a gift because it it's not until you see this stuff firsthand you build relationships with people that are different cultures, they're different religions, they're different walks of life. They're living in a with an actual dirt floor, you know, that is propped up by um, you know what are those things they put on the ground? Uh, not crates, but uh, the uh, yeah, pallet, like bamboo, they're bamboo, pallet. Uh, yeah. They're yeah, bamboo pallets, like half a pallet, yeah. a little piece of sheet metal, maybe if you're lucky on the roof. So it's really wild. And people live like that every day. In fact, the majority of the world. So when we talk about like a rags to riches in, in America story, you know, you're still like have running water. You like just you're you're in like a crappy apartment. Maybe you're in a, I don't know, a trailer or something that's run down. But like usually you know, it's not the same level. Even being homeless in America is a, is a little more luxurious than a lot of the, what they deal with in these other countries. Um, and I grew up running homeless shelters with my parents and that's kind of what instilled in me. That's why both the first two books were about purpose. And I've always been trying to reconcile how to bring those two worlds together. It's very difficult. Cause I also, you know, didn't want to be poor. So I was, I got into entrepreneurship and corporate and, and all this fun stuff. And so my journey has been to try to reconcile the two. And, and I'm finally now full circle where I've dedicated my whole life to this calling that you and I both have. Yeah. Um, and it is a, it is a calling because it's, it's something that is very difficult to do what we're doing. Um, and if you're not called to it, passionate, if it's not part of your mission, like you're probably not going to stick. You what you're not gonna make it, you know. You're gonna fizzle out. It's just it's too hard to do what we do, you know. Um, trying to be thought leaders and and being putting ourselves out there, um, especially in a world of m a ridiculous amount of um, content, you know. Yeah. But I, I originally immediately resonated with your story when you said that. Yeah, thanks, Frankie. And and I know our life intersected to a certain extent even a few years later. I think it was that experience that I had in Ecuador that. Eventually, when I came back to Houston, I had opportunity to pursue my my undergraduate degree at the University of Houston. Eventually, graduated as as an electrical engineer, and had an opportunity to work in Louisiana as, a, as an intern in 2005. And so, I became passionate about the oil and gas industry. and And when I left Louisiana in August of 2005, I, I left with that with a little nugget. I was like, "Wow, I wish I could come back here and work full time one day." Mm -hmm. And it so happens that two weeks later, I get the job offer from the oil and gas company saying, hey, Eric, we, we will welcome you next year. As soon as you graduate, come and, and work in our company. And this was on a Friday. Three days later, 72 hours later, Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans. Uh -huh. And I have a job offer in my hand from this company that so was- did you have to flee New Orleans that day? No, I was fortunate enough that I was already back in Houston. So, oh, okay, yeah. So all my be back in Houston that I had made were all back in in, in New Orleans. Oh yeah, that was mm -hmm. a hell of a day. I remember, and I remember trying to get a hold of them, and no one's. I can't get a hold of anyone. I can't yeah, get a hold cell, of my, cell service wasn't working. I remember that because yeah, we were laughing yet, and people were trying to like flood out, but a lot of people didn't leave. You know, down here, hurricanes. You know, it's just usually like that means we're going to throw a party. You kind of just hunker down. We're going to have a party. There's no school. This is great. You know, it's just a hurricane. And yeah. so that's what a lot of people did, unfortunately, because you never they never expected yeah. the levees to break and for it to become what it became. And 
you know, it, it was changed everything. Yeah. It changed everyone. And, and then myself being in For Houston, you, you didn't go back. Was, what everyone was moving to Houston actually from new Orleans. And yep. so it was, I, I, I would always go back to that experience I had in Ecuador with the decision I made next, mm-hmm. right? Everyone was moving from new Orleans to Houston. I had this job offer in my hand. The company still wanted me to go. And I said, you know what, if I could go and the only thing I have is just a roof over my head, I have electricity just a few hours a day. Yeah. That's going to be fine. <laughs> that's going to be way better than a lot of folks live. And if I could be part of the rebuilding of the city, then then so be it, right? That is my that is my role. That will be my purpose for the start of my career. And so as soon as I graduated from college, I moved to New Orleans. You very well know for some folks, it was still just like Katrina had hit two days earlier. Yeah, it's crazy. It, 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 that lasted and, a while. Yeah, it lasted a long time. So I had an opportunity. I'm grateful because of the the, the organizations that helped me when I was in college, I had opportunity to join those organizations now as a professional and be part of the rebuilding of those organizations in Louisiana. How long were you in New Orleans? I was in New Orleans part? for four years. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, so I was just around that I got there at the same time that Sean Payton, Drew Brees, and Reggie Bush got there. <laughs> so. Wait, were you there when we won the Super Bowl? Of course. Yeah, I oh was my in, God. I was in uh, uh, man, court, that right? was one of the greatest years of my life uh wow yeah so okay you now are passionate about this embracing disruption where did that where did that part come from yeah i think it goes back to that that first experience that i had had in ecuador and and i think every time my family or myself would put ourselves in situations say you know what this might be a little bit uncomfortable this might be outside of what you're used to doing but I would always grow from that. And I started mm-hmm. learning that. I started becoming very comfortable with that as well. And, and I think even the, the experience of moving to Louisiana was that as well. It's like, you know what? This is going to be very uncomfortable. All of my friends are moving from New Orleans to Houston. All the jobs are in Houston. But you're the one guy that's you know, driving the other way down I-10 into, into the city. Um, but I looked at it always like a learning opportunity and saying, look, mm-hmm. if everyone is going the other way, if I go this way, I'm going to be able to learn and serve and, and some, somehow grow as well uh, on that. And, and so it was through that that I think that started planting that seed. And then the second one is my role as an engineer was an automation engineer. And so my role as an engineer was to really create these systems using technology to drive these machines that would before used to take 20 people to do now would take maybe two. Frankie, right? Wow. And the question I started asking myself was like, what happened to those other 18 folks? Right. And right. but the jobs were safer, they were more efficient, um, they were they were healthier, they were um uh, they were less risky, uh, they were more profitable, et cetera. Right. So so I yeah. started starting to see like, wow, technology is gonna play a role in how work is done in the future. And so I started asking myself, was like, okay, how can I play a role into highlighting the speed that this change is happening? Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I, I don't know if I've told you this I've recently um, I've invested and partnered up with a, um, another friend that I met through impact 11. It was three ring circus back in the day. Um, and we started a, an organization called origin AI, which is specifically uh, committing to augmenting the future Love in it. which people aren't left behind. Um, yeah. So it's not, we're not trying to build novel AI. We're, we're more trying to help people, augment so they're not left behind and and part of that process is is called awakening where you just there's a lot of people that aren't even really awake to what it is we're doing and and until you have that you're not going to be able to get into what we focus on next which is the rebooting process so awake awaken reboot and uh create our is our framework that we use for that tell me a little bit about the framework you use when you come into an organization um that needs your help on figuring out how they're supposed to do it. Where do you start usually? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Frankie. Thank you for that. I, I think the first way that I, that I like to start with folks is, is, is understanding where the, each, of, each one of themselves are coming from, especially from a leadership team perspective or an organization perspective is sort of saying, hey, why are, why are you here, right? Mm-hmm. They're all different reasons. And sometimes they haven't even articulated to themselves. I right? say, so, hey, we're passionate about the mission of this organization or about this company or about about the revenue we're going to make, but they're all in there for different reasons. And, and, and one of the things that I want to make sure that, that I open up when I work with different organizations is for them to, to create a space to share that, right? And understand, mm-hmm. hey, 
why are your teammates in the space that, that, that you are? And what that does is it starts creating an environment of trust and understanding, yeah. hey, you know what? This is my peer. This We're all here for for probably different reasons, but we're all going the same way. And, and I think in this environment that things are moving super fast, our ability to communicate and build trust is still at the, it's, it's still core to, to the work that we do today how, or, or the work that we're doing 20 years ago. That has not changed. That human piece of things will even be more critical today than it was in the, in the early stages of the Internet. Wow. And so I think that's, that's very important uh, for organizations. And then I would say the second thing is for them to understand, and I think you highlight, you highlight this beautifully in your book, right, which is, which is the importance of being present, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes we're so passionate and enamored about how the future could look like, but the most, the, the most important decisions we can make today is, is in the present and in the organization today. And so how do we become present in the business that we have today, but understanding that these trends are moving extremely fast? And how do we bring those organizations to meet those challenges? But the first step is to really build that the sense of trust in, a, in, in the organization. And second of all, is how do we become present in the business and the organization and the goals that we have today? I love that. So a lot of it is about really a mindset shift that you're walking them through. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and, good. Yeah. And I would say the final thing, I think what we've tried to get out of this is really that sense of abundance as well, right? The mindset of abundance, going back to your point, right? Is, it's interesting because that's exactly- how do we look at disruption from an abundance mindset. And, and I've always been, again, very fortunate because of the different paths that I've taken in my life is be like, hey, you know what? This disruption is actually a good thing. Like, what would it look like if we lean into this? What would that look like for my particular role, for my particular career, for my particular business, if I were to lean into- how this thing is going to change, right? How it's going to change. Right. So when you say abundance, so usually uh, innovation is born out of scarcity or desperation or a problem, right? Are you saying that like the, what, what, what we have to do now, and, and if you are, I agree, but you're saying that basically right now we're in a time of abundance. And so it's harder for people to innovate because they don't feel the pressure yet. Uh, so I, w- I would say the folks that that have difficulty innovating are the ones that are that are that are looking at it from, hey, this has worked great in the past. So I have no pressure to a certain extent. Right. OK, to, good. To do something tomorrow. But yeah. what happens is that that pressure is instantaneous now. Like there yes. is. no oh, OK, let's take the long tail. OK, in six months, I'll be disrupted. No, that disruption could happen at in any two moment. weeks. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that because, you know, as you know, you know, one of my big topics is love your weird and, yeah. and, and really change is inevitable at a, at a much faster rate. I mean, you know, Netflix, they've got to a hundred million users, took them three and a half years, Instagram, two years, chat GPT, five days. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was on CNBC recently for an interview I and, I, and I talked about that uh, because, you know, w- all we can do is one, be honest and authentic about the problem, right? So if, if we can't be authentic and honest about what our problems are and, and include the entire organization in that feedback, we have no business even attempting to do anything. So that's really what I always find is the first thing is you've got to get honest and take inventory on what's the problem and what are we going to have to like throw overboard to not sink or to not you know have an air, air, a hot air balloon that stays on the ground right you got to yeah. throw the sandbags off so that's the that's a big thing that i think is important but you you talked about uh in one of our previous conversations this idea of unique perspectives tell me a little bit of how you draw that out uh in your process yeah and and and, and again this is thanks to the experiences that i've had that i just didn't realize until probably it was my college years right when i started going in there yeah. especially as an engineer they tell you, hey, look to your left, look to your right. You know, maybe one of y'all were not going to make it. Or at that time, that's what was like, yeah. we were prided on that. But I, I think we started clicking there. It's like, wow, there's this assumption that we're all going to graduate. One, at the exact same time. Two, with quote, the exact same experience. And three, with the exact same skill sets. That is completely incorrect. Interesting. You will not. So even though you're walking the exact same uh, space with that individual in the exact same university, you, the background that you have has already put you in a different, completely different situation and a different path than the individuals right next to you in the exact mm-hmm. same classroom or in the exact same organization or exact same company. And so I think one is recognizing that. Two, I think the other, the, the other um, piece that's very important, especially in this era of con- constant change, 
is that the individuals that you bring into your organization are, are not necessarily the individuals that are going to be following your instructions. Those individuals are going to be helping you scale and grow through the disruption. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is I, I learned this through uh, a leader in one of, our, one of uh, the companies I work for. And he told me, he's like, Eric, if you come and work for me and I give you 10 things to do in a month and you come back in two weeks and have them done, you didn't do your job. And I looked at him like, what did he just say? It's like, wait, wait. So I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I did everything productivity, productivity wise by, you know, hundred percent faster. It's like, can you tell me a little bit more about why did I not do my job? Uh-huh. He says, like, I need you to come into my organization and do the first three things and learn from them and tell me why the other seven things that we need to do need to be done differently or not be done at all. Because if our ability to grow this company is just based on, on the leader himself or herself, then we're not doing, you're not really leading our organization in this new era. No, like, and, when, and, and, era. You won't, won't, and you won't make it. You, you won't make it. it. Yeah. Everybody you, has to be a leader. Now, everyone, a, everyone, every has, single person has to be activated as a leader. And everyone, everyone's unique perspective needs to be understood and activated as well. And, and so, I love and, that. I and and because that. we need the collective. I mean, because think Absolutely. about it like this I mean, chat and all these AI models, they're using the, the collective. Uh, brain power of five, six, seven billion people. I mean, how are you going to compete with that if you can't even use a collective 500 or 100 or 5,000 in, in your own organization? And so Absolutely. it, but it's easier said than done. Um, yes. But it is so wildly important. And, you know, I, I talk a lot about that idea of like, how are we going to unlock the authenticity, but also imagination. And so one thing that I've learned is that there's a time in all of our lives when we have a raw level of authenticity, imagination, and a, a abundance, generosity mindset. Okay. And I believe that that moment is the same for all of us. And it's right around five years old. All right. And there's science to back this up. I've, you know, there's a NASA study that talks about uh, this study they did with uh, a sample of the United States with five-year-olds tested them for genius level of imagination. I don't know if you've ever seen this study, but basically it came back in 98% of five-year-olds oh. identify at that genius level of imagination, the same wow. genius level that companies like NASA are looking for to make sure that we stay ahead as a superpower in the world. So anyway, that's one of many studies around this, right? The other thing about a kid from an authenticity standpoint, they don't have a reason to be somebody else. They can just be who they are. They don't know yet that they're supposed to be something else, right? Okay. So let's talk about five-year-old Eric. So yeah. before you moved to Ecuador, five-year-old Eric, what, what were you into back then? Yeah, so as a, as a parent of a nine and a six year old now, I've been going back to those days uh, as right. well. Right, and being like, mm-hmm. wow, I remember those moments. Um, I, I was, believe it or not, I was somewhat of a performer. Um, okay, I was really into like um, Michael Jackson music at that time. Hell yeah! Or not. And so my mom would give me like these these Michael Jackson uh, costumes, and I had the glove, and so I would perform, and and so for my parents and for my family. Um, I never became a, 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 a singer or into music, but, but now looking back at those moments of, I mean, even now what I'm doing now as yeah. a thought leader, as, as, as someone that speaks and that's very comfortable on stage, um, it probably started off in those days and my parents and my family's just embraced it. And, and so I was, I've always been known as the Michael Jackson, um, the uh, Ecuadorian Michael Jackson. Ecuadorian Michael Jackson. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so, so now when I see it in my, in my, in my kids, right, that, that they absolutely, right, that sense of genius, the sense of imagination, the sense of, hey, the, the, the world is much more expansive than for them than sometimes it is just for us. And, 100%. And, and with, their, with, with their view of the world, it's, it's just a beautiful thing to see. So it's been great for me to li- relive those experiences through them and, and, uh, and even throughout the COVID year as well, right? We had to become very... Um, how do we say this? Very creative. Uh, yeah. How we engage with our kids. But what we ended up learning as parents is that their creativity of how to engage with us and create these experiences, honestly, they were much more creative than we were. And much so more creative. Well, they, with- and I think it's because they don't have the same limitations. So once yeah. you get past the authenticity piece of like, okay, I'm going to be authentic and be who I am, that's where not, you're not going to have a novel idea if you're not leaning into the things of you that are in you that are novel. So that's where the authenticity has to precede that imagination. And then, then from there, it's like, how do we share that? And that's the generosity component uh, because it's the, when you have that type of open-mindedness, 
you then get into the generosity component and that's where the abundance mindset that you were talking about mm -hmm. has Love to it. be unlocked. So I call abundance mindset generosity. That's my yes. word for it. So you can call it purpose. You can call it helping others. You can tell it this idea that if, if I don't take score and we're better together and we help each other that like, I'm going to be the one who reaps the, the maximum benefit, which is, you know, a thesis in all my books. Um, I'm, I've been calling that generosity lately just because I, I love that word. And it, it's a simple word that most people don't associate with innovation, but even down to the product, the best products are the ones that we feel like we're generous. Like, well, wow, we, we paid however much money for the iPhone, but it had so much, I would never trade it. And that's why we, we love certain products so much because we, we feel the generosity and, and the, the sense that like this was designed to help me. So we love the product. So you can, you know, it, it dovetails in all that. kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, it, frankly, that reminds me of, of a, a, you know, one of the things that when I speak to students today, especially the engineering students, they're like, hey, what are the, some of the engineering things that you, that you really, really use in school or that you really yeah. use sorry, in the professional world? Like, can you please tell us like, like what, are, what is a cheat sheet? Right? <laughs> that right. you go through it. And I'm like, there is none. Really what you learn is how to problem solve. Right. Sure. And at the end of the day, what, what you're doing either in school or an organization or in a company is that you're trying to figure out a way to solve problems. Yeah. Right. We're, we're, we're not going to predict the future. And if we do, it's not going to be very well. That's why most people are like really slow to predict the future right now. However, if we can set ourselves up to to instead of being surprised that things change, we just wake up and know that's what we're doing today. And that's uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. But once you give into it, and you realize that that is the true nature of, of where we're at and, and you create space for it. See, that's the whole mm -hmm. thing of taking inventory. We've got to get rid of the stuff that's taking up the space that is absolutely required at this point to succeed. And, and that's difficult because there's a lot of letting go that has to happen. And that letting go is painful. So, but that, that is the emotional journey. That's now a huge front and center part of being in, in, in business, being in, in, in this new capitalistic universe that we live in called America. The fact is, is that, you know, the emotional component of this, that's why all of a sudden, like it used to be like a nice to have type thing to have like mental health and all this like meditation and all these different things. And now it's like, it's front and center because everybody's burning out. And, and, and quite frankly, what I think is going to happen next from a burnout standpoint, if we don't take this seriously, is going to make COVID look like a walk in the park. Mm. As far as burnout, mm. it's it's going to be it's going to be special, and so we and, all have to take this seriously. And Frankie, would you argue that the tools and the access to resources that we have today versus twenty years ago, when I agree with you, they were probably luxuries, right? Is probably much more open today, right? I mean, our yeah. ability to find the the the, the correct tools and the right methods to, yeah. to, to go through these, uh, through these new tools that we need to build into our toolbox, the, our, our ability to access them are much greater today than they were just 20 years ago. I completely agree. And you know, it doesn't surprise me that you were a, a performer, by the way, when you were five <laughs> at all. So what, what I will tell you is that I, most of the guests that come on my show and the friends that I have nowadays fall into this 2% bucket. Because okay. what happens is at, at 10 years old, they, they studied the same kids. Only 30% still identified as creative and oh. uh, genius level. Yeah. yeah. At 15, it was 12%. Yeah. And by adults, it was 2%. Wow. Now, I believe that most of us, like yourself, we've made the tough decision and the commitment to follow our imagination, possibly off a cliff, uh, and be, be willing to be in that 2%. I believe that you are in that 2%. Um, I believe I'm in that 2%. And I believe it's our role to help unlock some of the 98. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think I, I, any, if I was, if you and I were talking to anyone in, in our uh, circles of um, people that really are doing this thing for the right reasons, which I think is, you know, summed up as a calling. Uh, they all are in that same bucket. We, we, we truly do want to make, degrees of change for the world and that's why we're committed to this yeah absolutely frankie I, I, i've been blessed and fortunate enough to not only meet yourself but other individuals that are in this space and and again from the spirit of abundance the spirit of 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 uh, of gratitude 
I mean, you, you see that in this in this in this community, and and when you're yeah. surrounded by individuals like that, you get fueled every day to be of service to 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 the other communities, right? That 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 are out there not only in our country but all over the world. That's right. That's right. Well, I love it, man. So did did you say you're working on a book, or did I just dream that up? <laughs> you just brought it up, but you're not the first one to bring that up. Okay, uh, I've heard everybody's that always working on one, but you haven't got one out yet, right? You're, you're. I have. Do I, I do not. I am a okay. consumer of of y'all's mm -hmm. books, and so if you're listening to this now, I know Frankie, you recently released the audio. Yep. Uh, of your recent book, so if you have, if you're a fan of this podcast, you're going to love that. Uh, oh, yeah, and it's book. great for lazy readers like me. So <laughs> you just have the whole thing read to you. It's no big deal. Uh, yeah, I mean, speaking I, of I, having I, stuff I read like to you, to you are working on one? I would like to start working on one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, you're yeah, going to do great. And, um, you know, have you, uh, you, this is kind of off subject, but have you messed with Speechify yet? No, tell me okay. more. Okay, okay. Apparently 23 million users are on it, but... <laughs> I stumbled into it because I was like, I always like uh, when I'm writing something, I'll like use the like read it back to me feature on the iPhone where you swipe two fingers down or whatever. Well, I found Speechify and you have to pay for the version I got, but Snoop Dogg or Gwyneth Paltrow read all my content back to me now when I'm working on it. All right. Yeah. So if you, it's, it's really awesome. They have all these different characters, but my favorite are Snoop Dogg and Gwyneth Paltrow, they've somehow deep faked their voice. And um, I'm going to tell you, when you are working on content, when Gwyneth Paltrow reads it back to you, it hits a little different. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm like, man, that was good. Like if you're yeah. just, if I just read it back myself or just looked at it, I'd be like, yeah, it's pretty good. Have Gwyneth Paltrow read your content back while you're writing your book. You'll enjoy the yeah. process way better than I ever did. <laughs> nice. And, and, and if I leave another tip too with, with our listeners today, right, is, uh, I've used this app called Pocket for some time, uh, mm -hmm. especially someone that travels uh, a lot. I would, if I find a really interesting article, particular topic, I would just uh, get the URL and then upload it into Pocket. Yeah. So I can read it later and it kind of takes all the, you know, the, the you know, the, the ads and some of the, the other stuff off of it. So it kind of just plain text. But now what they've added is that you could even listen to the article now as well. Yeah, right? same you know, stuff. I love that. And it's like, wow, it, they're making, you know, our, again, our ability to access tools and resources. You could use it as a as a super strength, right? As a superpower for you to yeah. really get more equipped and always continuously learn and continue to grow. As well, as because these things become also much more easily accessible, they could also become very distracting, right? To your point earlier. Yeah. Like, How do they go and that is in, in focus. Focus is an. I have a focusologist as a friend. Uh, she coined the term, and and quite frankly, I think that it's it's brilliant because that's going to become more and more of of an issue. Yeah, is that going to be really? We we are going to have to be very focused on what it is we bring to the table because if if we're generalist, those are going to be the jobs that are easier to unseat. And so that's where it's so important that all of us are asking the questions of like, what is my unique perspective? What is my unique offering? And how do I lean into that more mm. as opposed to making it a sideline? And I think that's what, that's, that's, that's the big question, right? Especially because we don't know what's coming. We know it is coming uh, in some ways it already has come. So yes. um, it's better off that we are all thinking of how we're going to make our existence because you still have to make your existence enjoyable. I mean, let's face it. I mean, because sure. otherwise, if we just like brute forcing everything, that's where the, we, we're going to burn out um, or be on the more drugs than our heart can stand, you know? So, you know, those are your two options copious amounts of drugs or burnout. We need a third option, you know? I can joke about that, Eric, because I've been sober for a while. You know that because you read the I'm with you. Yeah. I know your story. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you know, this has been super fun. For people that want to learn more about your content, because I know you're like really starting to ramp that up. Yeah. Do you have a website or where can I just Google? Yeah, you? Frankie, yeah. The listeners can find me on all the social media platforms uh, and also my website, ericjrodriguez.com. And the J, I'm assuming the J is important because maybe there's, is there other Eric Rodriguez's? There's like, a there's lot brand of Eric Rodriguez's. Yeah, the, don't forget the J, everybody. It's a, <laughs> it's a hard J. 
Yeah, there's, there's, hard Jay in the Rodriguez. Um, there's an apparently there's another Eric Rodriguez in California that was running for mayor uh, not too long ago. Classic. And so I got some really fun text from some of my friends in California say, Eric, are you here? Like, are you yeah, you're running for mayor? Yeah, well, listen, there's a Frankie Russo, New Jersey. Looks nothing like me, bald head, kind of talks like a Jersey guy. Uh, it was a radio star. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, he's not. He, the show, I think, ended in like 2021. But for a while, it was really hard to even like catch an edge. No, no, and then no. it. And then it was like buying the domain name of your own name, right? So, so I could see yeah. why the J is important. Make sure you drop the hard J in there and with the Eric J Rodriguez. Okay, I yes, love sir. it. Eric, always a pleasure. Can't wait to see you again. I think I'm going to see you probably next month. Uh, yes. Maybe Detroit. Does that sound about right? Yes, yep, we'll be there. There you go. Love it. Okay, uh, for those of you who are listening, watching, thanks for tuning in again to the School of Y podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.